Today on Muscle Car, Project Limelight's power plant comes together. Learn how a block is sleeved, and Tommy gives some assembly tips that apply to almost any engine. Plus, Rick shows how to convert from an automatic to a four-speed. Hey guys, welcome to Muscle Car. This super clean second-gen Camaro that we call Project Limelight is coming right along and quick. We've already straightened out a few dings and rust spots and laid down the first coat of primer. Then we got busy on the front suspension and rear end. We upgraded to big block style springs and sway bars and strapped in a 12 volt. But we didn't do all that just to put in that puny little 307 this car came with. We're going with the biggest, baddest engine you could get in these cars, the 375 horse L78. We picked up a 1972 GMC 402 because it's basically the same block you'd find in any Chevy badged as a 396 in the early 70s. And fortunately, our dream of finding a block as clean as our Camaro body fell apart when we tore the engine down. We've got two giant coolant holes inside the cylinder wall. Whoa, dude. Yeah, we'll probably need to give the machine shop a call and see what they have to say. And that's exactly what we did. The experts at Huntsville Engine and Performance gave the green light for sleeving and had some good info to share. Well, I want to thank you for helping us out with our 396-402 build, man, but when we tore this thing down, we wasn't even sure if this block was repairable. Well, in this instance right here, it may look bad, uh, but it's not as bad as it seems. This crack and this hole actually doesn't go all the way to the deck surface or to the main webbing, so we can put a sleeve in this at any time. Does this type of repair devalue the block in any way? Well, obviously, it's a repaired block. But in this circumstance, where you guys are going to be using this block, it beats throwing it in the garbage. And a lot of guys have to do this kind of stuff on something that's got personal meaning or a collector's item or matching right. numbers. Right, right. That makes sense. Because otherwise, it would just be a piece of scrap iron. Boat anchor. Yeah. That's right. Before any metal is carved out, the boring machine is set within a thousandth of an inch of what's needed for the sleeve to fit. Boring it out takes several passes shaving a tiny amount of metal each time. Any single part of the process can make or break your engine, so be sure to deal with somebody that's got a good track record. The wall isn't bored all the way into the crankcase. Instead, there's a little bit of a lip left for the sleeve to rest on. The sleeve itself fits very tightly, so it's gotta be sweet talked into the hole with a little gentle persuasion. Once the sleeve is seated, the top is taken down near the deck height. We're done knocking metal out of the cylinder for now, so we're moving on to the line bore machine. The idea behind this is to return the crank journals to the proper alignment, which could have been thrown off during the installation of the sleeve. We're also having our block deck to give it an even surface, which ensures a good head gasket seal. After a couple passes, you can start to see the high and low spots. Couple more passes, and there you go. No more holes. Man, that looks pretty good. What else do you like? You just need to cut your vibe release in it and bore and hone your rest of your cylinders. And you can come get her. Well, I guess I'm gonna see you in a couple weeks. It's better work for you. That'll be wonderful. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. See you then. All right. Well, our block is all done. The valve relief in the cylinder that's been sleeved has been ground out to match all the others. Most blocks don't require this relief, but the valve train design of a big block Chevy is kind of unusual and needed that extra clearance. Sweet, man. Looks like you're ready for some reassembly there, huh? Yep. Cool. Well, that's my cue to stay out of your way and go finish some priming a block. And so if you need a hand, yell. All right, dude, I'll do it. Cool. Up next, how to get your bottom end in top shape. Plus, Rick makes a fashion statement. Hey, welcome back. There are hundreds of different block designs, but when doing an assembly, most of the process is pretty much the same no matter what kind of engine you're building. Today, when I'm putting together our 402, I'm gonna give some in-depth info on a few steps that can apply to any engine. If you decided not to have the machine shop assemble the bottom end, or if you're just planning a re-ring and swapping out the bearings, you need to measure for main bearing clearance. To do this, you need a micrometer and a dial bore gauge. First, I'm measuring the diameter of the journals using my micrometer from Powerhouse Products. To get the correct measurement, slide the tool back and forth until it tightly fits across the journal. Now we're using a two to three inch micrometer, so we know we're at two inches. 
Each one of these little marks equals 25 thousandths. So that's 700 and almost 50. So since we're one shy, that's 2.749. Repeat the process for all five journals. With a quality crank, the number should be the same except for the rearmost journal, which will be slightly smaller to compensate for crankshaft thrust. Next, drop in the main bearings and install the caps. I'm not using any lube yet because it's all got to come back apart again once it's measured. We're using ARP bolts throughout this build along with their ultra torque assembly lube. It prevents seizing and maintains a more consistent preload on your bolt. I'm following the same torque sequence I'll be using later for the actual installation. To calibrate my dial bore gauge, I'll set it to the diameter of the first journal using the measurement I took earlier. Then I can use my gauge to check the clearances, making a note of the variance of each one. Each engine has its own range of acceptable tolerances for bearing clearance, so make sure you've researched what your application calls for. Well, our bearing clearance is checked out. The front's right about 24, the middle three's 25, 26, and the rear's at 29. Perfect for what we're doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the main cap so I can install the crankshaft. Never assemble an engine with plain motor oil or you'll burn up the bearings. Royal Purple Max Tough Assembly Lube is designed to break in an engine without damage. Once you've hit all the main bearings, don't forget about the thrust bearing surface. Now we can drop in our Eagle crank, making sure not to damage the bearings by bumping them or sitting the crank in at an angle. The main caps are next with plenty of lube. They gotta go on in the correct order, which should have been marked on disassembly. I've offset the sealing joint of the rear main to prevent leaks. A few dabs of Loctite silicone will provide some extra insurance. Following the recommended torque sequence, I'll tighten the main bolts down in three stages for proper cap alignment. Now with the front four mains torqued, the next step is to true the thrust bearing, which is a pretty simple procedure. All you've got to do is hold the crank in one direction, drive it that way, hold it in the opposite, drive it back, and then torque the main cap. That's it. One last tolerance I need to check is thrust clearance. First, I'll zero out our Matco magnetic dial gauge, then check to make sure the forward to rear movement of the crankshaft is within spec. Now our thrust clearance checks out, but if yours is a little bit too tight, it's not that big of an issue to fix. All you need is a piece of glass like this picture frame I found in Rick's office, a piece of sandpaper, then simply take the bearing, lay it on top of it, Sand it a few times, flip it over, then reinstall the bearing, torque it down to specs, and recheck it. It's that simple. Coming up, more engine assembly tips than you can shake a stick at. And later, a marriage that's made to last. Hey, welcome back. Today we're assembling our Chevy 402, and with the crank in place, it's time to install the pistons. We could have ordered a standard set of 30 over rings, but since this is more of a performance build, we decided to go with a file fit ring for a better seal. The formula for figuring out gaps for a street engine is easy. Just plug your bore diameter into these equations, and that will tell you what your ring gaps should be. Insert a ring into the cylinder, then use a squaring tool to make sure it's properly aligned. Check the gap with a feeler gauge that matches the clearance you need. It probably won't fit at this point. Pull the ring out and make a couple passes with a ring gap file. Only take off a little bit each time because you can't put it back on. Check it again with the feeler gauge. The fit is right when there's just a slight drag on the gauge. Once you get the ring set at the gap that you're looking for, you need to deburr the ring to keep it from gouging into the cylinder or the piston. It's pretty easy. All you need is a little honing stone or a file and carefully smooth out all the rough edges. So once you get it deburred, I like to put the ring back into the same cylinder that it came out of to keep up with which ring fits what cylinder. 
I went ahead and gapped the rest of our rings and installed most of the pistons. This is a long process, so make sure to stay organized because you want to install the correct ring and the cylinder they were gapped for and onto the piston in the right order. When installing rings, always work from the bottom of the piston to the top, starting with the oil rings. For compression rings, an insulation tool reduces the risk of gouging a piston or breaking a ring. Use plenty of regular motor oil, not assembly lube here, or you could cause ring failure. Get it in every ring groove and don't forget the wrist pins. Switch back to the Royal Purple Lube for the rod bearings, then drop on a ring compression tool and the pistons are ready to install. With our setup of Eagle cranking rods, ARP bolts, Icon pistons and Hastings rings, we'll have a rock solid bottom end that will allow us to push our L78 to redline with confidence. A few gentle taps with a soft hammer should be enough to ease it into the cylinder. Take your time and be careful not to nick the crank with the rod in. I'm running the rod bolts down just until they're snug, then I'll torque them down to specs. Another thing to check is the clearance between the two rods. Eagle recommends 15 to 25 on the steel rods, and we're at 16, so we're all good. Since this is a stock L78 build, we gotta go with a cast iron head. Summit's got exactly what we need with their big block Chevy replacement heads. They'll have the stock look with the added performance and aftermarket head offers. These Felpro head gaskets came with a kit that includes all the gaskets needed for an entire build. ARP's thread sealer will prevent any leaks from the water jacket, and with a dab of ARP Ultra Torque on the bolt heads, they're ready to tighten. Comp Cams offers the factory grind we need for the L78. All we need to do is lube it up and slip it in. Comp also set us up with a complete timing set. The crank sprocket is pressed on first, followed by the cam sprocket and chain. After the bolts are tightened, bend the tabs on the retainer to keep them from backing out. Our comp lifter's got a dip in motor oil before being dropped into place, followed by the push rods. Now we've showed you how to adjust the lifters on a hydraulic camshaft like on Blue Collar Buick, but our L78's a little different. It's got a solid lift cam. Set a rocker on its stud, give it a few squirts of motor oil, and tighten down the nut. Adjust the lash until the correct filler gauge fits tightly. All right, man, I got all the panels ready for paint. Thought I'd come out here and give you a hand, but it looks like you about got it covered. Yeah, I just about got it done. This thing will be ready for that four-speed real soon. Cool, I'll go get some parts together. Sounds good. You're watching Muscle Car. For a DVD copy of this episode, just go to PowerBlockTV.com and order your copy for just $5.95 plus shipping and handling. Start your own Muscle Car collection, delivered right to your door from the PowerBlock. Hey guys, welcome back. In converting our 1970 Camaro from an automatic to a four-speed, well, we did have a couple challenges. One of which was finding an original Muncie gearbox. Well, it took a little searching around, but we did come up with a good rebuilt unit. Next is finding a stock appearing bell housing, clutch linkage, and pedal assembly. Well, American Powertrain is your one-stop shop for all this stuff. Their bell housing is an exact replica of the original GM part, right down to the casting numbers. The difference is where you can't see it. These are made out of a high titanium alloy that resists cracking from high torque. We're stuffing American Powertrain Science Friction Billet Steel Flywheel and Triple Grip Clutch inside. We chose this clutch for its unique design. These separate rings of Kevlar and Ferramix mean it can handle all the torque we'll throw at it. These guys also supply everything else needed to make this conversion work, including 1970 replica pedals. There's two ways of doing this. You can bolt the bell housing to the motor first, then bolt up the transmission, or you can do it this way and bolt the bell housing to the transmission and install it as a unit. A dab of grease on the pilot shaft will help the throw up bearing move easy. Then you can snap in the clutch fork. The rubber boot will help keep dust and grease away from the clutch. Hey, fella, I got the big block all put together. You ready to bolt on that four speed? Nice, I got everything ready to rock. Good deal, man. I'm gonna go take a short break. The pilot bearing needs to be pressed into the back of the crank. Its job is to support the input shaft and the transmission. 
Next up comes the flywheel. After lining up the bolt holes, some gentle persuasion will seat it onto the crank. Be sure to use red Loctite thread locker on all these bolts, because you do not want these things coming loose. After torquing down the flywheel bolts, the clutch goes on using the alignment tool included in the kit. Top it off with the pressure plate using more Loctite thread locker on the bolts. Now once it's all torqued down, you can pull the alignment tool out and bolt up the transmission. How are we looking up there? Yeah, I think we're looking pretty good. Make sure the splines on the input shaft slide into the splines on the clutch disc before you run any bolts into the block, or you could damage the transmission, clutch disc, or both. With the engine and transmission married, we can drop the newlyweds into the subframe. Aww. Right there. Since we're using all factory parts, it goes together with no problems. Well guys, we are well on our way at converting our 1970 RS Camaro into a ground pounding RS SS. All the major components are in place. An L78 spec 396, Muncie transmission, upgraded front suspension, and 12 volt rear end. If you have any questions about anything we've used on the show today, check it out at PowerBlockTV.com. The body work's all done and it's sitting in final primer, so it's ready for some paint. But we're all out of time for this week, so until next week, y'all keep it between the ditches.